You're listening to the Rich Dad Cryptoverse podcast, where the force of financial education merges with the power of cryptocurrency. Here's your host, Rob LeCount. Welcome back, everybody. Hey, Jim, how are you doing today? I know we have a extremely special guest on, and I'm really, really excited to sort of listen to you guys banter, and hopefully I can not sound too much like an idiot. But uh, I'll let you go ahead and introduce him and tell us how you're doing. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, brother. Thanks, Rob. I'm doing well and always good to be on the show here. And we have a highly esteemed guest with us and a face that probably many people know in the blockchain gaming industry enthusiast. We have the co-founder of Alluvium, Kieran Warwick, joining us on this episode. So, hey, Kieran, it is so great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, James, and very, very lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's true, man. Your, your reputation precedes you in the space, and you know you, you guys are doing some very innovative things, and we just want to talk about all the facets and, and merits of Alluvium. So why don't we start with, can you give us the genesis of really just the whole project? Where, where did Alluvium uh, begin? Uh, and mm-hmm. where did you really draw your inspiration for the game itself? For sure. So we started back in mid, oh, the journey for me started back in, in uh, early 2020 when my brother approached me and he said, look, crypto is taking off. And for context, that brother, Kane, he runs Synthetics Protocol, which is uh, another top 100 uh, protocol. And he said to me, look, DeFi is taking off, get back into crypto. Cause I, I used to invest in it back when Ethereum was trading at like $8 and Bitcoin was a hundred bucks and all that fun stuff. And, uh, and yeah, so he, and, and I had a different startup that I was running at the time. And so I was dismissive at first and then slowly, but surely he, he won me over and I started investing again into different DeFi protocols. And then one day I, I stumbled across a game called Axie Infinity, which really pioneered the play to earn space. And I didn't necessarily like the game, but I loved the technology that was behind it. The, uh, so that led me to to start looking into NFTs and how they work. And I was really, really convinced that this was the next stage for, for gaming. It's, it's a natural progression. Gamers have always wanted ownership of their assets and, and this allows them that, th- this grants them that, that ownership, but the games aren't great. You know, what, what would happen if we built a really, really immersive RPG game that was open world that had collecting and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and so I thought, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's give the people what they want. And uh, Alluvium started after that. That's great. And you know, what, tell the audience, what games did you draw some inspiration from in the creation such. Pokemon, Pokemon yeah. and team fight tactics. So the Pokemon side of it is it's the, the game's kind of split into two, two, two modes, if you will. So there's the overworld, which is all about uh, exploration, harvesting different plants and materials that you find and capturing these alluvials that live in seven different regions across the the planet and the second part of it is introducing auto uh, auto battle elements so instead of the typical rpg turn-based combat in pokemon which is a little bit lackluster this is a very complex immersive skillful battle that needs to take place in order for you to capture your alluvials like it. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and I know, uh, you know, I've heard you talk before. So, 
you've referenced how when you were younger, Pokemon and, you know, collecting the cards and, you know, getting all into that. So it, it definitely looks Pokemon-esque. And I, I just want to say for the audience of people are listening and, and, and auto battler, if you're like, what does that really mean? Also known as auto chess. So we could say mm-hmm. it's like a sub genre of strategy video games. Uh, so Correct. You, know, yep. you can kind of, right? You can kind of see some of that. And uh, so can I ask you, why did you choose to go that route as opposed to maybe, you know, some other genres, you know, maybe an FPS or, or what have you? So there's three founders of Alubium. Mm-hmm. We're all brothers. We're all extremely competitive and we all like getting our own way. And <laughs> the reason we had to go with two genres is because we couldn't agree on one. <laughs> and so that's we basically, that's yeah, yeah, that's, that's hundred percent true. No, we, Aaron basically said, uh, Grant and I were, were in the Pokemon camp and Aaron was in the, if, like the vehemently against Pokemon camp. I don't want to collect little cute things running around. I want skillful battling, you know, like that's, that's fun to me. And so it was, we just had to uh, compromise. And I, I actually said to him, I said, okay, well, if you want that, the only way you're going to get it is if you somehow blend the two genres together. So go and do that as the game designer and then come back to me. And he did. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. And, you know, I think I've heard you talk to the fact, too, that, you know, as opposed to a different genre, maybe say an FPS or, you know, something with a, a, an immersive story. Not, I mean, you have an immersive story here in, in the lore, but an overworld, like say something like if you were to develop uh, an overworld, like, I don't know, Star Citizens, right? Yep. It's something that would really take years so in this respect, this, this is what I want people to try to grasp too. Tell people how long you've been in development on the game. So you brought up 2020. So I hope people are doing the math in terms of where we are in 2022. So tell I was going to ask that same is, thing because it's always yeah, yeah. amazing Go to ahead. learn how long the cycle nice. of game development This is takes. what's credible, Rob. Yeah. yeah, this is what's incredible. Go ahead. Yeah, so we, <laughs> we've been going for like, 15 months properly. Like uh, the, the, the concept was born back in, I, th- I think like September, maybe early, early October. And we didn't really start building the team and, and whatever until like early December. So yeah, we're, t- we're, t- we're talking, you know, 14, 15 months, something like that. Uh, how many people do you have working on the project? Latest count was 215. Oh, my gosh. Holy cow. Rob, Rob, did you hear that? That's massive. So, pe- so just people all over the world? That's just amazing. Wow, it's really incredible. And what yeah, did you, all, what did you all start working out? remote. Yeah. Oh, by the way, so who's the oldest You're with your siblings here? Let everybody know. Yeah. So I'm the youngest. Uh, Grant is a couple of years older than me. Aaron is 37. So yeah, he's third. And then you got Kane, who is the oldest. Okay, super interesting. So here you are, right? You are endeavoring to build a AAA blockchain game. And for all intents and purposes, you're looking to roll out the first AAA blockchain game. And it's kind of cool when you think about it too. You know, we've had uh, we've had auto battlers before, right? It's not like that. That's like anything new. Um, and we've had open world games before. But what you're looking to do in building a AAA version of a blockchain game, combining those those elements and incorporating GameFi and NFTs, that's what you're endeavoring to do. That I think is um, hasn't really been done before. So given the time constraints that you have here, or or talk to the fact of, A, what's been the most challenging thing in the 15 months of doing this, but most games take a lot longer. For people that are listening, they take a couple of years, right? So how are you able to do this in a shorter period of time? And I get that you have a lot of people that are working on the project, but still, tell me how this is all coming to fruition. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good point. If if 
if we hit the timeline that we said that we set out to do, it'll be the fastest game in history yeah. to, to the, the fastest. Tr- Sorry, my Siri just activated. <laughs> Um, yeah, it'll be it'll be the fastest AAA game ever developed in history if if we can pull it off in the the timeline. And there ha- we're not. I would love to be sitting here saying, "Hey, we're like amazing and whatever," and we have some sort of secret sauce, and I'll sell it to you for a billion dollars. I, I don't have that, right? What I think we can attribute it to is it, it comes down to the team that we have, but it's something deeper than that. It's like, it's why is the team like they are, right? And it's the benefit of giving them tokens. So imagine imagine everyone, imagine the first 200 hires at Facebook if they all got a really, really decent percentage. Now, I'm, I'm sure the first like 30, 40, 50 people got a decent percentage, but we've, you know, we, we've given every one of these guys incentives to make the product as fast as possible, but as good as possible as well. They're, they're directly incentivized by the amount of tokens that they have. Now, on top of that, <clears throat> on top of that, obviously as well, we pay amazing salaries and and we are super laid back. We allow people to work when they want to work, and it just cre- it's created this environment where they're basically working for themselves. Right? They they feel like they're autonomous that they can make a difference. If they do a really good job, they can see the token price going up. So it's a a direct response to how well they've been working. And it's, it's highly, highly motivating. So they work probably double the, the amount of hours to a normal studio. And when you add up all those hours over a two year period, it means that we're doing things double the, the speed of a typical studio. Wow. Hey, I got to ask you too. So you, you just met, you just said your last word was studio. Uh, is this something that you're looking to down the road? Do you want to build on Alluvium? I mean, I'll get back to it. I don't want to digress too much into this, but you're just making me think of it. Is this something that you want to build out a real studio and this is at the forefront of what you're doing and, and, and this is like, this is your baby. This, this is it, man. This is like your crown achievement. It's your first game. But is this something that you would like to build on in the future and have other games come out and be a, you know, a real studio that garners a lot of attention in the space? Yeah, so we are the first DAS now, a DAS is a decentralized autonomous studio. We're, we're the first true, true decentralized studio, right? There's, there's a lot of studios out there or projects or games that say they're decentralized and whatever. This is, I've met 12 people on my team in person to, to put it in perspective. So we have 215, probably 220 now. Uh, people around the world that are working autonomously without any sort of boss over their shoulder or anything like that. It's like literally a complete remote network that has been set up and all of the communication is done online through discords, online meetings. And so it's literally the first decentralized studio in the world. And if you look at that, right? Like most people would say that's insane. Like how, like even a single, I remember back two, three years ago, there was this craze of, Hey, let's work from home one day. And people like, Whoa, like work from home, like on a single day, we're literally doing that every minute of the day. Right. And so I think it's shown that if you give people the ability to to showcase what they're good at and that's what you hire them for and you don't sit there telling them this is what you need to do and they're taking orders and whatever they just go and do what they're experts at it it creates a much much 
bigger effect than uh, than trying to you know handhold everyone and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. So in essence, I, I kind of hear you saying too that COVID is a catalyst really for some of this in people really working from home and it sped up maybe the process of the decentralized aspect of the actual game and you allowing that to happen. I mean, Rob, this is really a template. We always talk about what crypto is, right? This is in essence what it's supposed to be, that it's supposed to be decentralized. So that's really neat because you're not a micromanager. And I love that you're actually putting people to work out there and you're trusting that they're competent in whatever their skills are. They're prolific in these things. And I, you know, I know you and your brothers have broken up tasks, right? And you know what you're each really good at and you handle mm-hmm. different aspects. So I think it's really, um, it's a good example, I think for other games and maybe studios, you know, moving forward to look at that. Um, now let's get into, can you touch on a little bit for the audience, uh, Alluvium Zero, the companion game to Alluvium, just so if people hear that, they understand, in essence, what that means. How about explain it to me? Sure. I don't know what it means either. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> no worries. All right, Rob. So, so basically, a lot of projects out there started. So, and it's interesting. It's a, it's a really, really uh, good topic for, for your listeners. But... A lot of people out there started looking for digital real estate back about 18, maybe two years ago now. It started getting a little bit popular. And all of a sudden, all these projects came out and said, we're selling land, right? And and it was like, okay, but what does that land do? It's like, we don't know yet, but it's going to do something down the track. it's going to be great. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't worry about it. We'll worry about that after you've given us your money. Like, no. (laughs) And and Now, I have a massive case of FOMO. And so I saw this happening and we were over here in our lane, in our vertical, doing our thing. And I kind of kept seeing it and I was like, you know what? I want to tap into that, right? Like this, these people are selling massive, massive amounts of land without even a utility. Like let's, let's build land, but then let's build, like let's get some utility out of it. And I said to Aaron, I go, I want to sell land, come up with an idea of how we can sell it. And it was, uh, our CTO and Aaron got together and they decided to build a mini game. And so it's essentially, it's a city builder game. They're called idle clickers. They're they're not the most immersive game in the world, but if you enjoy slowly over time building things and, and uh, the, the idea is on these land plots that you buy, there's a whole bunch of uh, resource sites that you need to extract resources from. Those resources are what is required to do things in the main game of Alluvium. So you get these like farmers, if you will, or landholders over in one section, they might like playing that type of game and and that's cool to them. And and they wanna build up this empire of, of digital real estate inside Alluvium Zero so they can get as much of the resources as possible and then sell them to the, to the people in the main game for a profit. And so it's roughly, what it boils down to is roughly 5% of all of the in-game revenues in Alluvium will go to landholders proportionately. Right. But... Go ahead. Mm. Sorry, there's there's one other thing that we've added, which which is pretty cool and and relatable to to real real estate, is uh, we've the, there's an expansion coming which allows people to build mega cities, and so if you have a if you have a, a a bunch of plots that are situated close to each other, you can actually m- merge them into a mega city, which then you're talking industrial rates of uh, resources that that you're producing. So you're making a lot of money. 
Now, the problem with that is when we sell these land plots, tier ones and tier, t- there's five different tiers. I was just going to say, tier- explain that for people. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So there's, there's five different tiers and the different tiers, the higher the tier, the more resources you'll find on your land. So the more expensive it is as well. And so we want a situation to, to arise where you have a person who's bought a tier one plot, very modest purchase. That's you know all they could afford at, at the time, but they really wanted a piece of land. Then you've got that tier one plot in the middle of say 10 tier fours, threes that are all owned by a single VC. And he's looking at this tier one plot and he's like, sell me that plot so I can make my mega city. You know, I like, Absolutely. what do you want for it? Like uh, I, you're stopping me from earning millions of dollars and you have this crappy little tier one plot, like just sell it to me. And he's like, no, I don't want to sell it to you. I love my <laughs> tier one plot. And I love that I'm blocking you from building a mega city. If <laughs> the situation that I'm kind of referencing is the castle, which is a famous Australian movie where basically the, the people just don't want to move out and it's yeah, but you can see where that's Disney going. Example. I was going to use up. Have you guys seen the movie up and the old man? No, I haven't. Is, oh, it's right. Yeah. So Rob, I don't know. That's what I'm thinking of. So from us there in the States, that's I'm pretty cool because I, uh, I'm, I'm in, in, I'm heavily into DeFi, not so much into NFTs and game fire. That's like Jim and I chat all the time, but you've like put a veneer or a varnish on top of a node project is sort of what that is, right? A lot of node projects today have different tiers. They're they're rewarded in different ways. Some of them, mm-hmm. you can even actually merge them. So I think that's pretty brilliant. If you can turn it into something yeah. fun and the fact that it's built into the ecosystem and it's sort of necessary for the other game, which creates this other interactivity between the two different types of, I, I would say, uh, investors, I guess, at this point. That's really neat. That's really it- smart. That's actually crazy that you're the first person that has ever actually, without explaining the concept, it's, it's basically staking, but in a fun way, essentially. And, and yeah, that's really, really good pickup. And he That's doesn't awesome. even, right? He's saying he doesn't know anything about the game. Listen, come on, Rob, give yourself a little credit. <laughs> I understand the mechanics and the back end and the reward I know, systems. I know you do. It's just Absolutely. the NFT yeah. side and all the other stuff. But that's awesome, man. That, that Congrats. That's, mm-hmm. that's really mm-hmm. smart. Hey, mm-hmm. Kieran, get into talk to the audience about the upcoming land sale. So we're talking about land. Uh, educate the people about, you know, the upcoming Dutch auction, what that is, first of all. And then how you're configuring things. Sure. So we're selling 20,000 plots in this initial sale. In total, there are 100,000 land plots available. We'll sell those over the next sort of two years. A Dutch, a Dutch auction is essentially a reverse auction. So it starts at an uh, inflated price, as in what we think should be the price it might be three, four times higher than that. The reason that we do that is to, to and we start an, an education process prior to the sale to really tell people this is not, the, the, we're trying to eliminate FOMO and people just going, oh, I need to get the plot so they buy it straight away. This is a way for people to go, okay, I've got time. I don't need to rush this. I can work out which exact plot that I want to buy and at what price point I feel comfortable at. And so uh, they, they, each plot is, uh, is over a two hour period that, that it'll be on sale. And so it's, it's, it's meant to be, it reduces very, very fast, put it that way. So uh, it starts off, might be at one ETH, the first 10 minutes, it's gone down to 0.7 and, you know, so on and so on and so on as time goes on. Now, obviously, there are other people watching going, but thinking the same thing, like at what point am I going to pull the trigger on this plot? We can't stop all FOMO, but 
we can try and combat try it as it. best as possible. Yeah. And so, yeah, you? so that, that, go ahead. Sorry, you go. No, 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 no. You finish your thought. Yeah. So I was just going to say that's, that's why we do a Dutch auction. It, it seems weird because people are like, whoa, that's like, they're really high prices, but when they understand the mechanism and, and why we're trying to do that, they get it. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's on us. It's, it's a little bit risky because if you didn't advertise it, people would be like, Hey, that's just super overpriced. Like what's the deal here? But we, we will put a whole bunch of education behind it as well and, and let people know how it works. And I assume you've released the information about the mega, uh, what'd you call them? Mega cities? Mega cities? Yeah. Because then you get sort of strategic, right? Like, hey, with the Dutch auction, you're going to want to really be smart and get in early if you have a strategy <laughs> around creating something like that. So it does, then it does have some additional benefits to it. Here, here I am trying to say no FOMO, and you're like, oh yeah, you better trying get to create FOMO. Yeah, sorry, that was not my intent, but like that's what I, I'm like. No, wow. no, I know. Hey, tell, mm. tell us. So a, a core tenant, you know, at Rich Dad, you know, is trying to find optimal ways, and I, I really anybody investing wise, right? You're trying to find, you know, uh, streams of passive income. So in terms of like in-game assets, namely land. Uh, will they be afforded the opportunity, players here, uh, to generate passive revenue? Is this, it, what, is this a game that people have to play? Or could somebody like Rob, maybe he's saying, I don't have as much time, but I would love to own land, you know, uh, digital real estate within the Alluvium ecosystem and to make money on that. Uh, or is this a game that like, say, like a Phantom Galaxies, Rob, right? We yeah. were talking to them the, the other day and we interviewed them with the planets <clears throat> You know, the game is really structured in such a way that it's uh, rewarding people that are playing the game. So, Kieran, how would you answer that? Well, Rob didn't realize, but he actually just became a business owner. Well, <laughs> an, a, he, a, he started an, another business. <laughs> and how that works is he's going to create a mega city and then he's going to realize, hey, I don't have time and I'm not 10 people running around playing this game but I have to play this game because it's earning me so much passive income. I'd be crazy not to. So then he's going to go, what do I do? He's going to hit up Fiverr. He's going to go into a few different discord communities. He's going to eventually find a guild. He's going to go to that guild and say, Hey, I've got this mega city. I need 15 scholars to run that mega city. I'm willing to, to pay those people X amount per hour those people are in third world countries. So they look at it and it's like, hey, I can go and drive my taxi today for $4 an hour, or I can sit on <laughs> my computer or my phone and play a game for $6 an hour. So they're happy. Rob's happy because he's getting his resources and all he has to do is come in and once a month, offload those resources when they're at a premium, ideally. And, uh, and then Rob makes his money and you've created a business. That's, that's so that's cool. Great. You know what I like too, Rob, he's ex what, what he's explaining is Axie Infinity, right? And how in developing countries, you know, whether it's right, right here and you're talking about basically about like the Philippines, people didn't even re really care about the quality of the game. This, it was improving their lives. And mm -hmm. it became like their livelihood. It was putting food on the table and transforming their lives. So it, it, you're endeavoring to make, again, we, we need to say this again, a triple A blockchain game that can not only give people that are into gaming uh, and, and hopefully you can, you know, you can talk to this too. How do we onboard uh, people that are in, you know, traditional gaming? How do you make this attractive enough for them to come over? Because we're obviously not near that point yet. Uh, we see so many people, a lot of detractors and people will say they'll criticize and disparage, right? Blockchain gaming and say, why would I come over? They look at Axie Infinity and they kind of laugh. They go, that's cool. You got play and, you know, play to earn, but I don't want to play that game because I think it's, you know, it's garbage. So let's be real, right? Let's be honest. Let, so yeah, you got to be, yeah. To do, right? Come on, right? You're a realist. So I think that's pretty cool that you're looking to pioneer and, and really combine those two things that they would kind of coalesce and, and come together. Can you delve into some of the 
yeah, you know, we say play to earn, but can we maybe say play and earn, right? Rob, yeah, and Josh yeah. got. Yeah, go ahead. Get into it. Wait, get one other thing aspects. too, Jim, before we go on, go you ahead. said AAA a lot of times. Well, can we define that? Like for people that don't play games or don't or don't understand game studios or just that ecosystem, like they have no idea what a AAA is, right? It's an insurance agency to most people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Kieran, I, Kieran, yeah, define absolutely. It. So it's essentially, it's a highly funded game. So usually budget of $20 million plus there's the cutoff is probably 250 for studio size. So we kind of slip in under that. Anything under that is, is considered pretty much indie. The reason I say AAA studios, because give me six weeks and we'll be at 250 people. But, uh, but yeah, they're, they're the two main things, right? It's, it's money, it's resources, and the, the caliber of the, the team that you actually have. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, didn't, I actually didn't know either. Like, I always thought it was based on the quality of the games they typically produce over time. No, no, no. It's, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, a AAA studio is typically defined as a studio that keeps on creating AAA games. It is pop possible for a AAA to produce a, a like an indie style game. And, and they obviously do, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the loose definition. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, Kieran, Kieran, I'll delve into some of the play, play and earn aspects of the game. Like uh, tell people. I'll just quickly. That's what's uh, exciting. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just quickly pull up some images just so the audience can get an idea of like what's available now and what's like what we're talking about here. Cause I think it's important for people to see like, why aren't people coming over right now? Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, as in great. why aren't, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I'll just. And I want you to answer that. if you don't mind, I'm like, when do you think that'll happen? What's going to be the tipping point? for thank you what's good kieran what's going to be the tipping point for people that are traditional gamers for them for to have like an epiphany and the light bulb to go off and they say man this is it i'm ready now to, to try this so yeah well yeah, go ahead and talk about the images too but yeah I'm yeah so it. okay so so this is what i saw right now when, when i first looked at the space I found this game and I looked at the art and I thought, oh, that's like either a mobile game or an indie game or whatever. But right. I thought it's cool that it's in crypto. Like, let's let's look what's under the hood here. That's when I found, you know, NFTs and whatever. And so the mechanics behind this game, what they did is brilliant, right? It's it's genius. Now the act the, the that's just the mechanics though. The actual game and how fun it is and the replayability, that's where I thought, hey, if we could produce something more like this, for example. Gonna see some. You can see that. That was a little leak that <laughs> was just on the screen for a okay. second there, but- it's all good. Nobody um, saw it. But yeah, so- yeah, so if you look at this right now, this th these are two D characters over here. Right. These are three. The ours are all three D characters. So that alone, to to draw concept art like this, like two D art, our our lead concept artists would draw all of their characters in probably two hours. Right. That's literally how long it would take. And so that's why people who know games, developers, artists. They're looking, you can't spin that. It doesn't matter how good you are at selling and whatever, you can't spin it as something that it isn't. People know that this is a very, very basic game, right? If you've played games before, regardless of crypto, it's a basic game. So that's where we come in and we want people to see this type of character is the first thing that they see when they, when they see crypto based games. And that's where we're at now, but uh, as in what, what do I think is going to get people to come across games like 
ours, but it's not just us. We, we're a single game in a single genre. We need first person shooters. We need MOBAs. We need like literally every type of game we need because it's the technology that is the brilliance here. Not so much. We're not trying to sell people, hey, there's amazing games over here already, right? It's amazing technology. Mm-hmm. For them to get a hold of that and to, to really grasp that. Can you touch on what you just showed people a picture of? Because some people in the audience may go, what the hell was I looking? It looked really cool, but I don't know what that was. So could you explain what that image was that you just shared? Yes. So that is an alluvial. So they're the characters. Think of that like the Pokemon of, of our world, Perfect. right? Yeah. yeah. By the way, if we had, po- what about Pokemon Go a couple of years ago? Oh my gosh. When you think about like NFT technology and stuff today, how transformative a game like that could have, right? I mean, when you really- Well, they, uh, they, they actually- so that game that I just showed you, yeah. they, they their inspiration came from Pokemon. And so even, I think I was reading an article or whatever, and, and it was Pokemon inspired game. And I was like, okay, like I played Pokemon my entire life. Like that is not Pokemon, right? Like Pokemon <laughs> are unique and they have personality yeah. and like backstory and lore and yeah. like all these things. And so it actually probably piques my uh, my interest even more and, and put me onto that scent of, of Pokemon and whatever. So, but anyway, I mean, uh, like uh, nothing against what those guys did. Uh, it, it's like, I take my hat off to Axie. Like they, they literally have pioneered this space, but you know, I'm, I'm a realist, as you say, and I can't, get behind saying that that is, you know, going to be an amazing game. Yeah. Um, you know, can I just quickly, so you brought up alluvials. How about alluvatars? Can you just tell people what those are and when we can see those in, in you know, I'll yep. you with the profile picture. So alluvatars, they're your in-game avatar. And that was our way of tapping into the PFP uh, profile photos uh, Thank you. NFT collection type thing. And it's a way for you to really show your personality through your avatar. So each Alubatar, you mint them as a base. And so you'll, you'll receive one, when you mint them, you get a random Alluvial based on the, the type of box that you actually, uh, sorry, Alluvita based on the type of box you buy. If you go for a diamond box, you've got a much higher chance of getting uh, a stage three tier five character. And once you have that base Alluvita, there's different slots and we call them accessory slots. And they're things like glasses, hats, cigars, tattoos, all of that stuff. And and you can really personalize your avatar. You then bond the accessories to that avatar so they can never be removed. And that becomes a single NFT that represents you across the entire Alluvium universe. And then uh, if you want to, if you end up leaving the Alluvium universe, you're like, I'm over it after five, 10 years or whatever, you can sell that avatar to someone else. And hopefully it should have increased in value due to the fact that you bought one really, really early. And with a Louvertars, each set only lasts three months. So if you miss minting in that set, yep. that's it forever. You're never going to be able to get that again unless you buy it from someone else. So uh, can people mint, um, for, is this for free, the first one? Or like, how is this going to work? So you can, there's a tier zero, which won't cost you anything. There's only a certain, there's only a few in, in that base. So it's going to be pretty common, but again, you can put a free one and then you can mint that uh, you can, uh, with a free base, you might go and win a tournament and all of a sudden you've won a free crown accessory from winning a tournament and you might, and this is where it gets funny because you've, it, it, people are going to go, that's a tier zero 
a Louvatar, like it's worth nothing, but he's just stuck a one of one crown on that Louvatar. Like now we have this random stage one yeah. that is rolling around with the most pimp accessory you can possibly buy. And he's put it onto a stage zero, like not even, not even a, a tier zero, not even a, 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 a real alluvial. So, yeah. Hey, if you don't like the accessories, right? So I have my Aluvatar and I accessorize that Aluvatar. I want a different look though. Am I going to be allowed to change that? Or no. Do I have to go? I have to buy another one then on the secondary market. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Um, and the reason okay. we did that, yeah, uh, typically you, you, yeah, typically you wouldn't do that, right? Like, right. That's why it, I'm it, it, yeah. yeah, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't stay true to the ethos of, of NFTs, right? Where, and uh, so it, it comes down to, I didn't want someone to be able to come up with a really good combination for their Aluvatar. And then someone else go, okay, well, he's just, because that looks so awesome, he, because there's literally millions and millions of combinations that you can put together. So if someone finds that perfect combo where everyone's like, God, that Aluvatar looks amazing. If you can decouple your accessories, someone is just going to go onto the open market and go, okay, well, he's got a backwards cap here. He's got the diamond, uh, pipe in his mouth and he's got a peace sign tattoo on his head and that combination is worth 50 ETH but the accessories to make that up are worth you know one ETH it's it's almost like an arbitrage and I just don't think it it makes sense right. well, plus it, yeah. it makes people yeah, ahead, like Mark. yeah I was just going to say like it also like forces people to really think about how they want themselves to be viewed right like instead of mm -hmm. like being this person that's like today I want a backwards hat tomorrow I'm good you know what I mean like this stops yeah. people and like makes people be more thoughtful and stops that backside gaming of like creating just the coolest looking thing that just could yeah. sort of torpedo all of it so that I think it's really Absolutely. that's smart as well like lock them down. Hey Karen, so I got a question for you now, right? So I want to take my Aluvatar. And I'll be allowed to take it into another ecosystem, right? I could take it into, say, Decentraland or Sandbox, right? It's going to be interoperability, right? I keep hearing everybody talk about interoperability. So that's pretty, right? A pretty simple process by which we can do that. Uh, uh, you know, I'm being facetious. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah I know. Me, please talk I'm to like, that. Please talk yes. to that. You're like, is this guy kidding? No, I'm, I'm Yeah. Tell no, no, no. Like, <laughs> unrealistic. I keep hearing, I keep hearing people talk about this and talk about the complexities that are, uh, how arduous this would be to do that. And if you could touch on how far away are we actually from that? How far away are we from Ready Player One? Like, so talk about interoperability. Yeah, it's, it, look, the, I, I, the reason why I was like, oh, my God, is because, you know, I, a lot of uh, it, it is it is being talked a lot out there. And we're, we're on a mission to try and educate people on this new way of gaming. And there are so many advantages that make sense that are applicable right now to gaming that we can use as our ammo to, to educate these people and show them to come across. Now, interoperability is possible, right? With NFTs, it, it does make it possible. But I'll caveat that. To collaborate and take, let's say, an alluvial that has attributes, an art style, 3D, like so many different elements that make it unique to, to being an alluvium asset. It has like so many different characteristics that it needs to have to be able to be played in our, in our ecosystem. If you take that out, that you're talking like different engines, different, uh, you know, 2D versus 3D, different stats, different style. Like, does it even make sense to, Bring, like our law of an alluvial means that there shouldn't ever be an alluvial 
that comes out of that and, and goes into like, like why is my alluvial now in sandbox? Like that breaks all of our law. There's just, there's just so much stuff that needs to happen before we can get there that I, there will be interoperability within the alluvium ecosystem because we control the entire alluvium ecosystem. Outside of that, we don't control it. And so it is theoretically possible if we were collaborating and we had the exact same standards as a different game, then yes, we could interchange assets. But again, like it's so far away that it's not even worth speaking about it. Yeah, just setting the record straight on that. But you know what? I like what you just said. So technically, you develop another game on top of Alluvium within the whole Alluvium ecosystem. So then we would be able to take our Alluvatars and they would migrate over. Or they would be able to be assimilated into any games that are built on top of this. I, I mean, come on. That's, that's pretty neat. So uh, hearing that, I get excited just, you know, as somebody that's into this whole space, that's, that, that, that would be think, attractive. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, th th think you drop a thousand bucks or two or, or, or 2000 bucks into Fortnite or your kids I, drop 2000 bucks. If into I can Fortnite. interject, I have to interject literally before the interview, I have a 12 year old son, dad, here's $20. I need to buy something in Fortnite. It happens all the time. And I try to have, so I'm trying to reason with a 12 year old and go, dude, this is what blockchain gaming is, you know, your assets and you'll actually own them. And, and it's, yeah, go ahead, finish. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting, but I had to. No, 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 all, so, all good. I was, no, I was literally just going to use that exact perfect. example that, that imagine if, you, so your, your son, he's spending, he's probably racked up. Let's call it 500 bucks. Maybe it's more. Let's hope not. More. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay. So let's, let's call it a, a thousand bucks, right? Yeah. He's going to at some stage come to you and say, Hey dad, I actually don't like playing Fortnite anymore. And you're going to be like, uh, imagine if he just came to you and just said, like your, your 18 year old son just came to you and just said, hey, I, I just don't really want to use that car anymore. I'm just going to use a different car. It's like, no, but I bought that Great for your analogy. 18th birthday. No, no, nope, I'm just going to use it. And you're sitting there and you're like, it's a sunk cost. Like this car works perfectly fine over here. Why can't you just use that? We've already spent the money on that. That's exactly what's happening here, right? So he, he's, and, and to be honest, he probably wants to take it with him. It's not like he, he, he doesn't, right? Like he, he wants to save you money, dad, Absolutely. but yes. he can't, right? Like he wants to take his unique Fortnite skins over. But if Epic then release a new game and everyone ports over, he's going to be able to take those assets. He's not going to be coming to you saying, hey, I need another you know, thousand bucks for this game, dad, it's all possible to be ported over. So that's the cool stuff that is, is, is happening and, and is possible now. I love that. I was hoping you would, you would touch on that. That's a great example. I love the analogy uh, of the car. Uh, <laughs> so from there, I mean, we could talk forever. I'm going to try to, you know, try to land the plane in a second. How far no down the road after, after you would say game launch, Will we possibly see, uh, you know, a mobile and, you know, console versions of the game? Console isn't even on the, the roadmap right Not now. The There's, radar. Okay. Yeah. But mobile, we're looking to be sometime in 2023. Oh, that's fantastic. Very cool. But, but Alluvium Zero, the, the city builder game that I was talking about, the mini game, that is releasing on mobile and Mac and Windows. Wow, that's cool. You know, I got to ask you, here, here's something that I think is really pertinent. And I don't know if you've been asked this question before. I, I really don't. But it's something that I feel uh, is germane to the conversation. Kieran, what do you want your legacy to be with, with all of this? And, you know, not personally, I'm just talking about in the space, 
in blockchain gaming, what do you want people to say about you? You, you know, obviously your brothers are, you know, are, are part of this. You guys have done this as a, as a team. What do you want your legacy to be with this whole game? When people look back five, 10 years from now, what do you want them to say? What do you want, you, you know, go, go ahead, just touch on that. I mean, it's a, I hate talking about myself like, like in this way, but I, I, I guess I would like, but I mean it think, like as it's tethered to the game itself. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. yeah. So, the project, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love them to say, you know, wow, those guys, those guys saw something that no one else saw for you. Like this, this, because right now in mainstream, we're probably three, four years away from that aha moment happening, right? So it's already happened within crypto. There were crypto people who was under their nose like they're looking at DeFi, they, they also love gaming and they didn't see this, you know, they didn't see how NFTs could be applicable in games and how that would literally change the game. That would be my thing. I would love people to look back and go, you know, like, like the, when world of Warcraft came out and people like that was the, the first time that people played an MMO where you were like, Oh my God. Like they've done, like this feels like another world that I'm in. By the way, I have, I have like, Go ahead, I think Rob. like I'm six sure. level 70 characters in world of Warcraft. So <laughs> I was so immersed in that game. I even convinced my wife to like start playing it through using the auction house. I was like, it's really <laughs> fun. You can like get deals and like whatnot, but yeah, like super immersive. Like if we can recreate stuff like that on the blockchain, can you imagine if everything that's, in World of Warcraft that you had, your character was, oh, a, you like, know how much Joe, time I've spent building those dude. characters? It's enormous amount of time. They're actually right, like or blizzards or whoever. I think it's Blizzard at this point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, no, like literally, and, and and that's what I go back to all the time. Like Vitalik started Ethereum because he was annoyed playing World of Warcraft that he couldn't own his assets. That was one of the biggest catalysts to him starting the network that we're literally building on. That's amazing. Would you, would you say it's fair? I love that you brought that up. Would you say it's fair that just blockchain gaming is going to be a huge catalyst or um, onboard a lot of people just into crypto in general? Because that's my assertion. I really without a doubt, right? Without a doubt, I like. Right? I, I will go. I will go on record saying that without a doubt, gaming will bring in more people than any other vertical in crypto by probably twenty x. Wow, twenty x. That's pretty crazy. That's interesting, man. Well, listen, man. I, I, I hope you're correct in that. Uh, you know. What can people do right now? So they, they've listened to this, this conversation. And what's the next step for somebody? Maybe this is their first exposure to Alluvium. Uh, what should they do in moving? For, obviously, get in the Discord, right? And Rob mm -hmm. and I always harp on that. You have to be part of the community. And you do. We're both in, you know, in the server. It's an amazing oh. server. You know, I'm always there checking stuff out uh, and, and high level, like questions. Some really smart people in there, but people are learning. People are very helpful. Uh, but what else can people do in getting, in preparing for this if they would like to play? Educate. You, you need to educate yourself. Like it, it, I spent, as I said, six years ago, I was in the space. I was investing and whatever. I left it for four years. I knew nothing when I came back, like literally nothing. I spent months and months and months just, I mean, out, this is just outside of even gaming, right? This is the next internet. Crypto is that. And there's opportunities everywhere. I, I mean, prior to starting Alluvium, I just started investing in the space and I turned 100 into a million in like four months. Just educate yourself on what exactly blockchain, crypto. And then once you, you know, once you get to that point where you feel comfortable with the concept, then in terms of Alluvium, educate yourself on how the game works, 
why it would be so compelling for a gamer to play Alluvium instead of something like Pokemon. And again, it stems back to in Pokemon, you're going to spend the exact same amount of time capturing the, the creatures, the exact same amount of effort, all of that, except in Pokemon, that's going to be owned by Niantic. In Alluvium, it's going to be owned by you. That's the difference. Who doesn't, like you said before, man, who doesn't want to own their assets in the game? And then to, to walk away and you lose them really forever. As you turn the page, you beat the game, it's done. You've, you've conquered it. And then you got to move on to a new game and you can't bring anything with you. And you really have nothing to do <laughs> for it. So, yeah. So, hey, listen, that's why, again, going back to, you know, my personal story with my 12 year old, like telling him, and, and he saw the trailer and the trailer is breathtaking. I, the, the gameplay looks great. I mean, there, there's so much to uh, the game and, and, and there's a lot that we don't really know yet. Right. So, Hey, you mentioned too, before we even uh, got on the interview here about the private beta, can you tell people, um, you know, when we can see, I, I'd love to actually see that myself, but well, it literally was, yeah. we were, this is actually, a, it might still happen. And I don't know when you're uh, publishing this, but we were actually trying to push for it to be today. I don't think it is going to be now. I, it, it definitely is ready to go out. The only problem is it's uh, Easter long weekend. So yeah. we probably have a bunch of uh, devs away. So uh, we may release it literally today, but probably on Monday. Wow. Well, that's something to leave the audience with. And we're excited to see that. Hey, listen, we are so appreciative of your time. We know how busy you are. Uh, we wish you success, you know, in, in, in this endeavor and everything else. And we look forward to following this. And I'm going to be playing this with my 12-year-old. I told him if he wants to live in my house, he's going to have to play blockchain <laughs> games. And he's going to have to make the transition over. And it was pretty easy when I showed him uh, the trailer. But really, just, where, uh, just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just say? be super careful with that because he might be earning more in uh, when he starts, <laughs> he when he starts school, playing right, a little bit. He's oh, like, God, man. sorry, Dad, I actually, at 12 years old, I retire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making more money than you. And listen, yeah. I try to show him that and tell him stories. But come on, man, that's part of the allure of this too. I mean, that that is part of it. I don't want it to, we don't want to lose focus of, you know, people that just grind and grind and grind and they're not really enjoying the game. But to actually sit there and have an experience where you love the game, but you can also uh, be compensated like, for that to incentivize just, it. To just, yeah. Go ahead. 100%. Like, just watch that. Like, imagine if I told you, Rob, that you're going to earn money from playing World of Warcraft. I would like, be a quadrillionaire. At this point, <laughs> quadrillionaire people yeah. like pe people died playing World of Warcraft, like they died <laughs> playing the game, and there was no money involved. You you put money on the line. I I don't even. I'm actually scared to see what's yeah. gonna happen. Like we'll hey, see. Wait, but but listen, like you have in your game. Like I I don't want to get too deep into because we're ending here. But I had to like people can wager on battles like in the Leviathan arena, right? So mm -hmm. PvP, yep. the battle arena, that's kind of cool. You could technically lose a lot of ETH, you know, going against or win a lot of ETH. <laughs> or yes, I should say it that way. You're right. Yeah, that's <laughs> F4, you win. You're not gonna lose. But yeah, I yeah. love it. There's 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 really so much to it. Uh, again, we can't thank you enough for, you know, coming on the show here today and educating the audience because that's what we're about. None of this mm -hmm. is financial advice. Everybody has to do their own research. Uh, but we hope that you find much success and you actually, Alluvium really becomes the first AAA blockchain game. So, Kieran, we wish you well and we will talk soon. Thanks so much for having me, guys. That was a lot of fun. Love the questions as well. It was awesome, man. Okay, I can't wait. I have the uh, utmost. I want you to create the first blockchain game that I'm actually willing to play. <laughs> You're gonna play it. I'm, you have no yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting. Let's do this. I'll be doing. Let's do it. All right. Do our best. Don't worry. All right. Thanks, guys. Go. Cool.